to Hope in the Night. I'm Miss Patricia. I'm glad I can be in your house tonight, wherever you might be. If you're listening to the archives, I thank the Lord that I'm able to be here with you tonight. We're going to discuss the goodness and the severity of God. Yahweh loves us, yes, but like a good father, he will correct us if we disobey. He wants us to obey him. That's why he's given us his commandments, his moral law. Yes, God is love. If you're a mother or father, you love your children too. But if you're a good parent and they disobey, you'll correct them. 
as the Bible tells us to. So will God in different ways during our walk. The word says if he wouldn't correct us, we're no more than a bastard, a fatherless child. And if we continue in rebellion at the end of time, we will be cast into a lake of fire, which isn't automatic burn up your annihilate it. No. Hell is real. Hell and death will be cast into the lake of fire. And the lake of fire is eternity. Eternal separation from the Lord. With his weeping and gnashing of teeth. We need to do a program. Me and Brother Larry one day will do a program on hell. On the lake of fire. The amount of times that Yahweh spoke about it. The amount of times that Yeshua spoke about it when he walked the earth. And it wasn't created for us. That was created for Satan and his demons, his angels. God doesn't want us to wind up there. So let's talk about tonight what's not spoken about in many, many ministries. The severity of God and His goodness. Father God, I come to you right now, B'Shem Yeshua, in the name of Jesus. And I ask, Lord God, that all hearts that are listening tonight the, the ground would be broken up so that the seed of your word would fall on good ground. That ears would be open and ears would be unstopped and eyes would be open. That they would know the truth and the truth would make them free. Father, show us tonight in your word that you love us so much that you will correct us. Father, we love you. Help us to understand that we must walk holy before a holy God. That we can't continue to sin that grace may abound. more so now than ever it's time to get right with you Father help us tonight help us Lord God to understand your word and Father I ask that you would help use that you would use my mouth tonight to bring forth your word that it would be only you that self would get out of the way tonight. I thank you, Father God. And we pray all these things, Hashem Yeshua, in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. <coughs> I ran into somebody on a post that I wrote today saying that God is love and that if I don't if I don't realize that I will wind up lost to stop telling people that he's a God of wrath and I asked him what Bible version are you using this goodness and severity of God. Where is the balance? Where is the balance? We have to be a balanced gospel. 
the goodness and severity. Not the goodness and the severity. It's balance. That is what we're lacking right now <coughs> in most churches. <coughs> Excuse me. In most ministries. Not all. A lot of them are preaching the truth. But most it's all about love. Love, love, love. All you need is love. I've got that audio clip that I made a few years back. Brother Larry, I have it for Friday night. All you need is love. Love is all you need. Now, it's his grace and his love that draws us. His grace and his love drew me from being killed in that car wreck. Those of you that know my testimony. His grace and his mercy woke me up. Otherwise, I'd be in a late, I would be burning right now in hell. I would be in the grave, awaiting being tossed into the lake of fire. If I had died in that state before repenting. His grace and his love drew me. Because the minute I opened my eyes after hearing Patty wake up, it's like everything flashed before me. And as I got in his word, I repented as soon as I got home. And as I got in his word, it opened up to me like never before. That's another thing. It's more than just a sinner's prayer. Repeat it after me, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. Um... I come to you, I come to you. Uh, and then the following week they're back at the altar again. Do you ever hear, I repent before I have sinned against you and in your sight alone? I'm sorry? No, it's all, ask Jesus into your heart, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, come into my heart, come into my heart. Okay, God's going to bless you. He's going to give you what you need. You need that job. You want that spouse. You've been, you know, now just plant the seed and, and God's going to bless you. No. God wants to crucify our flesh. He wants this to die. He has no use for this. This flesh, it stinks. You don't believe it stinks? Don't take a bath for about a week or two. Our flesh stinks. There's nothing good in us, the Bible says. Nothing. That's in the Word of God. No man seeks God. The Bible says that too. No man wants the Lord. All have gone astray. Let's keep it real tonight. Oh, yes. This is supposed to be a program about hope. Yes, I'm going to give you hope tonight. The bad news is that we deserve to be tossed into a lake of fire. The good news is if you repent and you turn from your sin, you don't do a 360, okay? A 360, you wind up in the same spot. You do a 180. You turn away from your sin. You turn away. And you leave it behind. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. Every time I see the news, I, it just gets more and more embedded in my heart to shout, repent. Oh, I've got a whole life ahead of me. I, you know, I, I can have fun. I'm, I want to go out and hang out with the people, you know, with the with the crowd and you know having a good time I'm only I'm young come on I could do that later you don't know if you have tomorrow you don't know what the future holds this is the day of salvation not tomorrow today right now this moment Drop to your knees right now, wherever you are, and cry out to him. Ask God to forgive you. He will. 
If you mean business with him, he will. He'll forgive you. I know. I just turned 62. It's a miracle that I'm even here today. I was a drug dealer in Queens College and in a lot of other places. Over in Ozone Park I hung out, Richmond Hill. I was either stoned or drunk 24-7. could have been killed several times. I could have OD'd more than that. I had no respect for myself, so I gave my body away. For drugs? Hindsight, I see the goodness and the severity of God. And I thank Him that He's allowed me to come through all of that. And to be able to share with you tonight that there's hope in the night for you. Let me pull up my notes. This isn't preached in the church. I'm not in the chat room right now, so excuse me. Got my whole screen filled up with the notepad at the moment. I'm about to read you a short story in the book of Acts, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. If more preached this as they did, well, let me read it. <clears throat> but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price his wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles feet now this isn't about tithes and offerings okay tithes is Old Testament this isn't about money it's about deception lying okay listen <clears throat> some people have used this in some of these churches that you're going to drop down dead if you don't give you money. That's not what it was about. It was about deception. Lying. Lying. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Doesn't anybody ever catch that? To lie to the Holy Ghost. Lie? What is the unpardonable sin? And to keep back part of the price of the land. While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? So why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied to men, but unto God. In other words, you didn't have to promise nothing. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. He died. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men rose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto, and answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for this for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. And then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and found her dead, carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. They saw the power of God the severity of God. And 
In the visions which John was given, Messiah portrayed as a powerful warrior king. Upon his white steed, he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty in Revelations 19, 11 through 21. It's not very popular of a picture. The vision of the Lord as God of fury, God of wrath and fire. And we hear much about his grace and kindness, but we hear too little of the other side. The scriptures treat both sides, a divine nature of grace and wrath. We need to talk about both sides, not just one. We're encouraged to behold the goodness and the severity of God, Romans 11, 22. Living in the fear of God, our thoughts and our ways should reflect both mercy and the vengeance of God. He is a merciful God. That's why you're not dead right now. That's why I didn't die. He's merciful. We should reflect God's mercy by clothing ourselves with a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, tender-hearted and forgiving one another. And we should re reflect God's wrath by obeying him with fear and trembling. That's Philippians 2.12. The realization that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God or to make us tremble. To remember God's kindness but to forget his severity is to live in a fool's paradise of false religion. There is goodness and severity. In Yahweh. <clears throat> David in his relationship with Bathsheba experienced both the kindness and severity of God. The story is told in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. When David slowly became convicted, he said, well, let's take a look at that. Let me, let me, let me bring that up. So, I don't have my ease sort up yet. I had to reboot. So I'm pulling it up right now. There we go. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, Second Samuel, turn there with me. I hope you have your Bible out tonight. Second Samuel, chapter 12. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to start at 7. Wait one second. And the Lord, we're going to start in verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came into him. Wait one moment. The Bible calls David a man after God's own heart. And those of you that know about David know he done a lot of bad things. Listen to this. And the Lord sent David unto Nathan unto David, and came unto him, and said unto him, There were two men in one city. He's giving him a story. The one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him. And with his children it did eat of his own meat, and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and spared to take of his own flock, and of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man, 
that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb, and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, that man hath done this thing, shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art that man. If you go back, David had seen Bathsheba up on the roof bathing. Instead of turning away, realizing, oh, that's another man's wife, because he knew it was. I'm not going to gawk at her and drool over her. He kept staring. He sent for her. He slept with her. She got pregnant. He sent her husband to the front lines to, to fight, hoping that he would be killed. That's part of the story right there. Read it. Go back to uh, 2 Samuel 11, chapter 11. You'll, you'll get to read, or even 10. Let's look at verse 7. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives unto thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine own house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken thy wife Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. And thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee. Look at this. Out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all of Israel, before the sun. And David said unto Nathan, How dare you accuse me of sin? How dare thou judge me? No. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also has put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. when the Lord shows you in that secret time your sin do you cover it up or are you quick to repent if you have a heart after God you'll mess up I mess up but I'm quick to repent you don't continue to sin that grace may abound when God shows you one area, if you need to spend time in prayer and fasting to, to get out of that, do it. And then don't go back there. The Bible says that that's like a dog going back to his vomit. David was convicted. He said, I sinned against the Lord. He was told of God's kindness. The Lord has caused your sin to pass away. You shall not die. But then he received the blow. However, the child that is born to you shall surely die. He paid for his sin. The Lord struck the precious child. And regardless of all David's pleading with God, in spite of all the fasting and weeping, he was told, alas, the child is dead. That's the severity of God. There is a view that the period of the Old Testament was characterized with the severity of God whilst the period of the New Testament is characterized by the grace of God and that's not so it's one book it's true that God's merciful grace is greater in these latter days than ever the great grace he's shown in the times past but the his severity is not lessened it's quite the opposite his severity is even greater now. The more the sun rises, the more severe the heat, the, its heat comes. With greater grace, there comes greater severity. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses died without mercy. How much more severe punishment do you think he will deserve 
who has trampled underfoot the, the Son of God. Hebrews 10.29 Yes, Yeshua, Jesus, died and rose so that we might be forgiven. But should we continue in sin? Does that give us the ability to keep on doing what we want to do? To lie, to steal, to cheat, to covet, to break his Sabbath, which is the seventh day, not the, the first. Read it in the Bible. If anyone can show me where Jesus, Yeshua, said in the New Covenant, in, in the, the, the New Testament, after he was born, suffered, died, and rose. If you can show me in the red where he said, I am changing the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, to the first day of the week. And I'll do what you tell me. I'll do what it says. But the Sabbath is the seventh day. What effect should be holding the severity of God have upon us? What is the point of the fear and trembling? This is answered in Hebrews 2, 1 through 3. Let's go there. Hebrews 2. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For in the words spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was conform, confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witnesses, both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he now put in subjection the world to come, wherefore we speak. Be mindful of him. Be mindful of the Lord. He's wanting that no man should die, but all would come to the knowledge of him and repent. That's why you're not being struck down dead as you're partying on that joint right now while you're listening to me. Yeah, you. Thank you, Lord. How much attention are you paying to the word of Christ? Are you just drifting in the comfort of his grace, unmindful of his severity, and therefore not listening intently to every word that proceeds out of his mouth? We know that his word is his sharp sword, by which he will smite all who have not given to him the more earnest heed. I'm going to turn to Revelations 19. Revelations 19, 15 through 16. And out of his mouth goeth a, a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He will tread the winepress of the wrath of God. The time will come. If we look at Revelations 22, verse 12, it says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward with me to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments. The goodness of God, listen. 
that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. For without, outside the gates of the city, are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. It is in fear and trembling that you work out your own salvation. In Philippians 2.12 it says, Work it out your own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing, Lord, I want to do right by you. I've been through so much, Father. I don't want to now lose everything. It's not worth that little, that little, that little ten bucks that I see laying there. It's not worth lying or stealing. It's not worth it. I've been through too much. Only well, got a little way more to go. Pressing, forgetting those things which are behind me. I pressed to the mark of the high calling of God which is in Christ Jesus. Peter beautifully surmises how the severity and goodness of God work together in our hearts. He says, if you address as Father the one, well, let me pull it up. Let's go to 1 Peter 17. 1 Peter. One, seventeen through 19 and if ye call on the father who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work pass the time of your sojourning here in fear for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by traditions from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and spot, without spot, who verily was foredained before the foundations of the world, but was manifest in these last times to you. Sojourning here in fear. That's a pretty powerful scripture as you pass by, as you pass through this world, let it be with fear and trembling as you go about your day, always wanting to make God happy and you see his rewards are so beautiful. Me and my precious friend Diane were talking about the blessings of God before the program and she said God loves me, Jesus loves me. Yes, he does. He knows his children. And he blesses his children. Might not get everything we want. Give us what we need. Consider the goodness and severity of God. If God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell severity, but towards you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you'll also be cut off, Romans 11, 21 and 22. Paul says this to non-Jewish believers who through faith have been grafted onto the tree of God's people, whereas many Jews have been cut off because of unbelief. And to have balanced view of God, we got to consider his goodness and his severity. God's grace is popular. His wrath is not. But actually God's grace can only be valued by someone who understands the wrath of God. If you sit back and you think of all that you've gone through in your life, of all the mess that you've done, the lives that were hurt because of the decisions you've made, and where you deserve to be. I know that makes me, my heart tremble. And with much love and much respect of my Heavenly Father, in my alone time I cry unto Him and I'm like, Father, thank you so much that you had mercy upon me. 
when I see all the times that I could have been killed while I was dealing in certain areas. Certain really bad areas. But God protected me. We just got done picking up some drugs, me and another friend, don't need to mention their name. And on the way back down the stairs, this group of men with suits on were running up the stairs and we got slammed back across the staircase and my friend said let's leave hurry get down the stairs the next day it was in the news and I had just been up there with this big guy all of his girls were around him a couple of his men were there got what we needed heading out and these people like I said ran up the staircase I got slammed up against the wall and then I took off. The next day in the newspaper everybody in that that room upstairs was shot. They were shot down dead and the person in charge his head was cut off and it was found in a car. These people were driving around with his head on the front seat of the car. I could have been killed that day and would have went right to hell. Behold the goodness and the severity of God. I have a million stories like that. But it's only His goodness that has kept you safe so far. Run into His arms right now. Ask his forgiveness. Realize you need his forgiveness. You've broken every commandment. The moral law of God. The ten was written with his own finger. And protected in the Ark of the Covenant. Forever. If you've ever lied. If you've ever stolen. If you've ever looked on the opposite sex with lust, you've committed adultery. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But if you would repent, if you would confess your sins unto God, He will be faithful and just to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and to forgive you. the goodness and the severity of God if you choose not to ask his forgiveness either when you die or when he returns and judges the living and the dead you will be cast into a lake of fire and there's no exits no exits once you're there that's it Choose ye this day who you will serve. The wrath of God abides in him. What does that mean? It means that everyone remains under the wrath of God until the wrath is appeased. Wrath is aroused by something that is wrong. Wrath is intense, lasting anger coupled with the desire to avenge or punish. So why is God so intensely angry with us? Because we have done things that are intensely wrong. He's angry with us because of our sins. He's angry with me because of my sins. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says in Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. We humans want to justify ourselves and blame others for our faults, but God says there is no excuse for the bad things we do. God also loves us so very much that he provided a means, his own son, 
himself. God put on flesh. There's only one God. He's come as the three in the, in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But God, Yahweh, became flesh and died for us. But don't forget, he rose. Death couldn't hold him. He rose from that grave. And if we would just repent and come to him, I know I'm repeating myself, I have to. He will forgive us. God was angry with Sodom and Gomorrah because of the gross immorality, including bestiality and homosexual practices. The whole land is brimstone, salt, and burning. It is not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and his wrath. And that's Deuteronomy 29:23. God was angry with the Egyptians for refusing to let Israel go. His wrath is described in the Song of Moses, sung after crossing the Red Sea. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The deaths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. You sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble. Exodus 15, 4-7 In the wilderness, God was angry with his rebellious people. Moses told them, Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to the wrath in the wilderness from the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you came to this place. You have been rebellious against the Lord. Also in Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath so that the Lord was angry enough with you to have destroyed you. Through the centuries, and that's Deuteronomy 9, 7 and 8. Through the centuries, God was angry with his people because they rejected his word and worshipped idols. What's your idol today? What is your idol today? Is it gossiping? Is it lying? Is it stealing? Pornography? Homosexuality? Lesbianism? What is your idol? Fornication? When Jeremiah wrote, However the time of God's wrath had come, let me go back and read this. When Josiah heard the law read, he realized that God was intentionally angry with his people. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. And then the king commanded, Go, inquire the Lord for me, for the people and all of Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. The, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the word of this book. 2 Kings 22, 11, and 13. This was God's reply. Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and upon all the inhabitants. All the words of this book, which the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be aroused against this place and shall not be quenched. 2 Kings 22. 16 and 17, but Josiah repented. Judgment was postponed until after his death. And when Jeremiah wrote, however, the time of God's wrath had come. Let's look. So you shall say to them, this is the nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord their God. You could say this against America right now. Nor receive correction. Truth has perished, has been cut off from their mouth. Cut off your hair and cast it away and take up a lamentation on the desolate heights. For the Lord has rejected and forsaken this generation of his wrath. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight. Jeremiah 7, 28 and 30. 
the people here in America have done evil in God's sight, calling good evil and evil good. God's wrath will be upon this nation. Run and take cover under his wing. Psalm 91, read it. Memorize it. God's wrath is kindled against this nation. But there is a remnant within a remnant in this nation. And Yahweh is calling us out. He's calling those who will obey him out. For you will be appointed unto his wrath when it pours down. If you repent and turn from your wickedness, obey his commandments, keep in his word, God is angry when the weak are mistreated. It says, you shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you afflict them in any way and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will become hot, and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. Ouch. Don't be hurting the widow or the fatherless child. That's Exodus 22, 22 to 24. Revelations teaches that people serve either the Lord or the beast. What will happen to those who serve the beast? Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, whoever receives the mark of his name. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridle for 1,600 furloins. That's Revelations 14, 19 and 20. But there's no wrath of God. There's only love, love, love. You better start teaching your congregation or if you're a street evangelist, or if you're on Facebook, I ran into you today if you're listening. Love, 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 love. You better teach them. Great that you have a testimony. Fantastic that you've distributed over 20,000 people so far. But are you pointing people to your testimony? Or to the Lamb of God? I share my testimony. But it's not my first priority. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. Read Revelations 15 tonight when I get off. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. That's Revelations 15, 7. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. Revelation 16, 1. God's not wrath, though, is he? Yes, he is. If you choose to not obey him, and if you choose to change his word and teach a lie, his wrath will be upon you, too. Let's be well balanced. Through the goodness of God, believers are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. These are the ones, Revelation 7, 14, who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We will go through the tribulation. It's not just for the Jew and the Gentile is removed. I've heard so many lying teachings. Go to the CMV TV website. Pull up the blog. 
Look at the teachings that Larry Davenport has on there. Look up Bundles for the Fire. That's one of the teachings. The wrath of God remains a warning for Christians or believers. Ephesians 5, 3 through 7 says, But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking, no coarse jesting, which is not fitting, but rather give up thanks. For this ye know that no fornicator unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience therefore do not be partakers with them let's go to Colossians 3 5 through 7 therefore put to death your members which are on the earth fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. In other words, you've come out of that. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Romans 1.18 The wrath of God isn't in the Bible? He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John 3.36 Only when we realize the anger that God has towards sin can we really appreciate what he done for us in his death and resurrection. Consider the goodness and the severity of God. To those who believe in Christ and have been buried with him in baptism, Paul wrote, He was delivered us from the power of darkness. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably and with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Hebrews 2, 1-3 How do you escape the wrath of God? By allowing the goodness of Him calling you to the cross right now. By allowing His goodness, which is showing you the sin in your heart, your sinful heart. By allowing you, he's allowing you right now to hear his word. What will you do tonight? What will you do right now? I'm not going to give you a sinner's prayer because the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible. But I will tell you to cry out to him. To repent. And he will wipe away. He will throw your sins in the sea of forgetfulness where there'll be no more. And if you do get a sinful thought in your mind, be quick to cast it down. Be quick to ask him to forgive you again. I've heard people say that I'm forgiven past, present, and future sins. No, you're not. He's forgiving you of your past and your present sins when you repent. If you sin in the future, 
You gotta repent again. Father God, this is the day of salvation. Father, I ask that your, those that have listened tonight would not delay, that they would cry out to you, that they would realize that they sinned against you, against heaven and in your sight. I thank you, Father, for your convicting. Some of us plant, some of us water, but it's your spirit, your Ruach, gives us the increase. The Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, is what draws men, is what convicts men of sin. Nothing I say, it's your word and the presence of your spirit. This is your word, Lord. And I thank you that around the world right now, people are repenting. That they're coming to you, Lord God. That they realize that they've sinned, Father. Thank you, Father, for your forgiveness. In the name of Jesus, B'Shem Yeshua, we pray. Amen and Amen. If you want to write to me, you can. Please do. Let me know that you've come to the Lord. It encourages us here at CMB TV. It's a major encouragement. I've received two letters just today that I have to get to. I've been praying about them. So if you're listening tonight, I'm not forgetting you. I usually get back with people within a couple of days. Write to us. Patricia at WTVORadio.com or the watchman on the wall at gmail.com let us know that you're being blessed I'm going to leave you with one last song me and brother Larry will see you on Friday the song is called Be Holy and that's what the Lord wants. Be ye holy, because he is holy. We serve a holy God that loves us. I love you too. Thank you for allowing me to come into your heart tonight, your, your room tonight. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of your life tonight. And thank you for crying out to the Lord. He's heard you. I love you. Good night. Yahweh tells his people to separate themselves from the world. are not supposed to blend or be conformed with anything they do or say. We're not here to join in with the world and be like all the rest. We are here to do the will of the reflection of Yahweh and he says it so clearly in his word
follow him look just like the world there's no difference or distinction in their life in church on sunday morning with a righteous plastic smile but they're right back in the world on sunday night they come and visit god once a week inside the church all they have is a form of godliness but yahweh says come away and be set apart be separated from 